epipelagic to the hadopelagic. Fish live on the continental shelves that extend outwards nearly 500 kilometers from the shore, mostly submerged except for the terrain that sits above sea level. The water above the continental shelf is relatively shallow compared to the open ocean, but at the edges of the shelf, there's a steep slope that descends into the abyssal plain. Because the continental shelves are so elevated and so close to the surface of the ocean, they often receive enough sunlight to feed a much denser biota of photosynthetic organisms that would never be possible in the deeper ocean. As I've said before, the density of primary producers in a particular habitat is a key factor that's limiting the size of the ecosystem that can ultimately feed off of them. This means that these marine areas with access to sunlight are really fertile for life, because they can sustain viable populations of marine plants. And the marine plants can feed herbivores, and the herbivores feed all of the carnivores. And so you can see that having this large, viable population of marine plants that spread across the continental shelf can feed everything else in the food chain above it. And so having these plants is really important. It's critical for having this density of life that exists in the epipelagic. I mean, pretty much all kinds of life are much more common on the continental shelves. The majority of fish species live here as do marine arthropods and crustaceans. Corals exist with much higher abundance on the shelf than they do on the abyssal plain. And the primary producers that are virtually non-existent in the open ocean are able to thrive on the continental shelves. Some of these primary producers form kelp forests, literal forests of kelp that are floating there, and these are some of the most dynamic and complex ecosystems on the planet. The kelp is anchored to the ocean floor, and the greater photosynthetic mass rises up like a thin tree, buoyed by the water and held up to the ocean surface. In many cases, a mass of floating kelp will form a mobile habitat platform. When you look at a really big kelp forest, it looks really similar to a, to a terrestrial forest, although it's slightly alien in its physiology, and of course, it's totally submerged in water. The kelp in a kelp forest really does act a lot like trees do in a land forest. The kelp is photosynthetic. They produce oxygen that other organisms can breathe, and they create a three-dimensional habitat with a vertical element, which other organisms can use for shelter or protection. This also creates distinct regions within the habitat, like a canopy region at the top, which gets the most sunlight, and then increasingly shaded areas that are deeper and deeper into the ocean. And then finally, you have the ocean floor uh, below the kelp forest that looks like a dark forest. It's deeply shaded by all of the floating biomass above it, and it's studded with the pillar-like stems of individual kelp. The ecology of the kelp forest works much like the ecology of a dry terrestrial forest. Herbivorous species like kelp crabs, isopods, sea urchins, and various fish will all feed off of the kelp, eating the leafy fronds and occasionally using them to hide from predators. These predators, be they otters, lobsters, carnivorous fish, or whatever else, have been experimentally shown to be critical top-down regulators of a kelp forest ecosystem. This is because there's a very large number of herbivore species that would otherwise eat away at the kelp with reckless abandon. If they could get away with it, they would eat the entire kelp forest and destroy it. But fortunately for the kelp forest, the number of these herbivores are regulated by the presence of predators that eat them. This has been demonstrated, for example, with sea urchins. In the kelp forests off the coasts of Alaska, sea otters are the dominant predator. The sea otters will eat the sea urchins, and they'll keep the sea urchin numbers from growing out of control. But if you remove the otters from their Alaskan kelp forests, the sea urchins don't have to worry about predation anymore and so they grow and reproduce fearlessly. The exploding sea urchin populations will eat away more of the kelp than they usually do, and this leads to a direct deconstruction of the physical habitat. This can lead to the expulsion of numerous other species that live in the kelp forest, which causes a general degradation in the vitality and the biodiversity of the kelp forest ecosystem. This general principle has been experimentally observed not just in Alaska, but also off of the coasts of Southern California, 
Australia, Eastern Canada, Chile, and South Africa. Another type of complex ecology in the ocean takes the form of a coral reef. Coral reefs are pretty amazing because they serve as a home to more than 25% of life in the oceans, despite the fact that coral reefs cover less than 0.1% of the ocean floor. This is a data point that should reinforce just how barren the rest of the ocean floor is. Anyway, the core of a coral reef is created by corals, surprise, surprise, which are sessile animals equipped with filter-feeding polyps. If you do an image search for corals, you'll see what appears to be clumps of lumps. The coral looks like a tightly packed cluster of smaller, stubbier points, or tentacles, or protrusions. Each individual tentacle thing that composes the larger mass of coral is a single coral individual. It's an individual animal within a colony, and where they connect together at the base, they're often interconnected on such a level where they can share nutrients. These strange, immobile animals can extend soft tissues from the distal ends of their body, which wave around in the water to filter feed. They typically reveal themselves at night. Their soft tissue possesses nidocytes, or cells with stingers, and these line their soft tentacles. The stingers allow the coral polyp to stun, capture, and then consume food, for a diet which is mostly composed of microscopic animals like zooplankton. However, the coral polyps can also capture small arthropods scuttling near the coral, or even small fish that swim too close. Many species of coral, called the stony coral, secrete calcium carbonate to form an exoskeleton, which gives them both physical protection and physical support. As the corals typically grow in groups or communities, their exoskeletons can fuse together over time, and this perpetuates to create a giant mass of aquatic bone. This calcified mass is the substrate for more coral to grow on, as well as a huge number of other aquatic species, like sponges, tunicates, and other sessile nadarians. These immobile organisms create the physical architecture of the coral reef, which then becomes a home for thousands of species of fish, like the clownfish that live within the stinging tentacles of a sea anemone, as portrayed in the classic Pixar movie, Finding Nemo. The coral reefs are also home to worms, eels, prawns, crabs, lobsters, and mollusks like snails and octopus. In a very similar way to the carcass of a whale, the coral reef acts like an oasis of life that's bursting out of an otherwise barren ocean floor. Except where the whale carcass is generally pretty ephemeral, it gets digested and consumed and it dissolves and goes away after a period of time, the coral reef is much more stable and much longer lasting. Now, where the kelp forest typically exists in colder water that has frequent nutrient upwelling that's caused by currents and temperature gradients, the coral reefs are typically found within a broad equatorial band that reaches as far north as Mexico, Saudi Arabia, and India, and as far south as Madagascar, Brazil, and the northern half of Australia. These corals are pretty delicate, and they can't survive in marine habitats outside of this range. A temperature of 26 to 27 degrees Celsius is ideal for coral, but most corals can't tolerate temperatures that are that far out of that range. They really have a very limited temperature range that they can tolerate. They're, they're very sensitive. Climate change is also impeding the ability of corals to produce their calcium carbonate exoskeletons, which is ultimately degrading their long-term stability. Corals are also very sensitive to nutrient availability, and they typically rely on symbiotes to get the nutrient, and so they typically rely on symbiotes to get the nutrients that they need. Perhaps the most important of these symbiotes is the photosynthetic algae Zooxanthellaea. Because the Zooxanthellaea are photosynthetic and they depend on access to sunlight, and the coral reefs are dependent on the Zooxanthellaea for most of their chemical energy, the coral reefs tend to be concentrated in the photic zones of the ocean where their symbiotes can access as much light as possible. To sustain this symbiotic relationship, the corals will consume plankton through filter feeding. They filter feed the plankton out of the seawater, 
and they digest their little bodies down into nitrogen and carbon-containing compounds that then get shared with the zooxanthellae, which, in return, give the coral energy-rich nutrients like glycerol, glucose, and amino acids for building proteins. In many cases, the seafloor surrounding a coral reef is covered in meadows of seagrass, or the shoreline might possess mangrove forests. These examples of marine vegetation are essentially giant pools of nitrogen. When the seagrass or the mangroves die and their bodies decay, all of the nutrients in their bodies will dissolve into the ocean, and this will increase the local concentration of nutrients available for the coral reef. And because a lot of these, these larger plants, like the seagrass and the mangroves, they often have leaves which are very dense with nitrogen, when they die and decay, they're releasing a lot of nitrogen into the nearby water. And this is extremely helpful for all of the other organisms that live here, not just for the coral. Now, the mangroves, these, these mangrove forests, are themselves extremely fascinating habitats that have a very pronounced influence on the maritime ecology that surrounds them. If you want to hear the rest of this exciting episode, then head over to the Biologic Podcast channel. Become a subscriber, check out all of the other awesome biology content, and consider supporting the show through Patreon or the official store. And as always, thanks for listening.